everyone welcome to the charvak podcast this is your host kushal vera today's podcast is called the history of human sacrifice i don't know what is wrong with either me or abhijit ayer mitra that we decide to talk about subjects like this but here we are so just to give you an idea so every month abhijit and i sit together and we think, think of a topic to talk, talk about so while we were discussing this month abhijit says like let us talk about human sacrifice i was like abhijit why he's like because i want to talk about it so here we are abhijit welcome and start namaste brothers and sisters so i'll tell you why i want to talk about human sacrifice hmm. kamala kuchachu chukakum kumato niyatar rita sudanila tano kamala yatalochana lokapate vijayi bhava venkata shailapate sachaturmukha shanmukha pancha mukha pramukha kila daivata mauri mane sharanagata vatsala saranithe paripalaya mamrisha shailapate did you enjoy that people thank you see so uh, we need to uh, obviously uh, recite auspicious things before we start now i wanted to remember one of the themes that i keep talking about uh, be it here or uh, in other podcasts is you know the hindu um, inferiority complex the defensiveness that comes in when people raise things like sati okay uh, or the fact that we still have uh, instances of human sacrifice happening so for example when i was in jail in odisha uh, there was a guy who had come in from bolangir who had sacrificed his niece and nephew to some goddess in the forest so you know this uh, defensiveness this inferiority complex why i want to bring this up is so that you guys get some kind of a uh, a sociological background socio anthropological background on why these things happen how they happen uh, uh and uh, what is the rationale for them what is the social reasoning for them okay uh so that is why i primarily want to talk about it and i think this will be particularly useful for you in addition to uh, when you read uh, you know when you Uh, read minakshi jain's uh, statistical analysis of sati combined with the socio uh, sociological and anthropological factors that lead to this stuff so first let's talk about the old world and we're talking about the old world first which is to say uh, you know uh, eurasia uh, africa still uh, uh, you know comes later on in the subject surprisingly even though we all came out of africa we're all akhand kenya in that sense so uh the first thing let's go geographically right so let me uh, i didn't want to bring up images because i don't know if it'll get reported and shit like that uh uh but i did want to uh uh let's get a map of the world so that we can talk about uh you know going about this uh yeah I- i'll put it up when the image comes yeah okay here there you go so let's just talk about the old world right now theek hai uh, which is to say this area now some of the earliest instances of human sacrifice that we have come from round about this area what is called the fertile crescent theek hai na uh, these are the archaeologically attested uh uh instances of human sacrifice say from egypt all the way through the fertile crescent this is called the fertile crescent the euphrates tigris uh, things like that now iraq mein kya hota hai if you go to sumer now if you go back to the uh, 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 the uh, what was it the iron age bronze age uh, economy episode that we did uh, you know i brought up uh, lapis lazuli and the tomb of uh, queen puabi and the early sumerian burials and how sumer was a linguistic isolate you have the earliest retainer sacrifices here in this area where you know retainers to the king and the queen were buried with them some of them were given poison some of them were clubbed over the head 
you know, Flintstone styles head smashed in. And uh, you would, uh, uh, they would be buried and you'd have 30, 40, up to 70 people. Surprisingly, this, you know, continues for a while out here. And very surprisingly, even in Egypt, you have the first dynasty that is retained a sacrifice. The, all the tombs of the first dynasty of Egypt have retainers buried alive with the pharaoh. It stops, remarkably, it just stops uh, uh, by the time of the second and the third dynasties. It just stops. We don't know why, but it stops. Uh, but this area is really important now. I don't know, you know, where the oldest, I mean, this is a high, uh, 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 highly contested subject. But the uh, uh, basic thing here is, that it seems that organized human sacrifice in this fashion starts off sometime around the Bronze Age, though we suspect it could have started in the late Stone Age. Why is that? Well, it's for the very simple reason that humans, for some reason, acquire a power to start abstracting. Religion ultimately is based on a power to abstract. You can stop the screen sharing for now. Uh, 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 you know, is, uh, you know, uh, based on the power to abstract. Now, an animal can't think, ki, Bhai, ye mera bacha kyo mara? an animal can't think, oh, why did my house burn down? Or why did my tree burn down, technically? Uh, why did uh, uh, a disease strike my uh, uh, family and why did they die? So you have to then think of a greater power. I, Think about this. We all know what religion is. But for the first humans abstracting religion, you don't find examples of religion in any other primate species. We don't even know for a fact if uh, Neanderthals had a religion. But they ha did. Wasn't think there about some research, afterlife. Abhijit, about chimps having proto religion now? There is. You remember I sent you that video about chimps having what we think is proto-religion. Who was that famous uh, lady who all spent almost her whole her whole Jane life? Jane Goodall. Which, but Jane yeah. Goodall didn't discover proto-religion. This is a very modern thing. And it's more amongst bonobos than it is amongst chimps, I think. Uh, we think it is proto-religion. We still don't know because a tree stump, they seem to visit and offer stones to a tree stump. Yeah, and also we are anthropomorphized uh, and kya bolte, anthropomorphization. Bolte na, us cheez ko. We are looking at a chimpanzee from a human lens and we are attributing human things to a chimp, right? Right, exactly. Uh, we, we don't know if it is learned behavior, for example. Okay. Uh, uh, in those days, there wouldn't have been learned behavior because we were all kind of at the chimpanzee level. Uh, Homo erectus, for example, was probably only slightly smarter than a chimpanzee. Not too much smarter than a chimpanzee at any rate. So this becomes a problem of first fixing out when does abstraction begin? Because from the abstraction of a god to going to the need to sacrifice to a god is a huge mental step. We don't notice it. You will notice killing in almost every uh, uh, life form. But in return for a uh, favor from the gods or benediction from the gods, it becomes problematic. So this becomes an issue in pinpointing the thing. And this is where I start sharing my screen again. Uh, this particular find put back everything quite far back. And this is Gökbeli Tepe somewhere here in Turkey. Let me find it. Okay. Now, Gökbeli Tepe is around 12,000 years old. Uh, let me get satellite uh, imagery. Yeah, no satellite. Oh, usually upar hoti na option ha ye ye ha yeah oh sorry they put the covering on it but if you look here the oldest parts of this particular temple 
And I want you to look at this. Can you see this? This goes to between 12 to 14,000 years old. And this image is so it high resolution. Yeah. And look at this. Look at the size of these rocks. These are tons and tons and tons of rock. So clearly, even in the Stone Age, when there is no evidence of bronze at this point of time, humans were building temples. They clearly had the power of abstraction. Now, there's been no proof of human sacrifice at Gokpeli Tepe. But the assumption is that it is in the Bronze Age, in the essentially in the Neolithic and to the early Bronze Age that humans sacrificed, that humans attained the level of abstraction. Now, why do I say that this is happening at this point of time, only in the Neolithic, not the Paleolithic, which is to say the old Stone Age, the later parts of the Stone Age. It's because here, think of this also as a sacrifice. You could have been attending to your sheep. You could have been attending to your cattle. You could have been attending to, you could have been foraging for food. At this time, agriculture wasn't available. Yet, you chose to spend time carving rocks and things like that and making a monument to the gods. It is a sacrifice of time. It is a sacrifice of time and effort. A lot of time and effort. Imagine bringing 20 ton rocks like this onto a, uh, 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 a hilltop. Because remember, this is a hilltop. If you look at the uh, uh, terrain here, this is on top of a hill. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, it's not easy land to just drag up a 20 ton stone up here. It's not flat land. Flat land to either hai. Flat land either hai. And yet they have dragged the stone up here. Right. So it becomes very important in that sense that you see that there is the concept of sacrifice. It could have, of course, started even in the Paleolithic age when you had, you know, the rock paintings and things like that. Because this, again, is a sacrifice of time. The issue is there is no spiritual angle to it. Finding a spiritual angle at that point of time, like the Lascaux rock caves or the Bimbetka uh, uh, rock paintings and things like that, they're representations of life. Hmm. Okay, They're more an artistic expression than they are. And an artistic expression is actually uh, earlier to come across than a religious expression because a religious expression involves an exchange, which is, again, a very sophisticated thought process evolving. Especially with someone abstract, where you're evolving a thought process, ki main tumko abhi ek zind, I'm giving you a life now in return for something good, maybe one year down the line. Right? So it, it's now I know this is a bit difficult to understand. I can't see the comments, Kushal, for some whatever reason. Um, oh, I have put but, them off. I will put them back on. Because you look at the comments, that's the problem. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, please behave. I'm the only one that's allowed to swear out here. You people can't swear, okay? Yeah, because uh, that's uh, the whole yeah. point. So, to bad me comments, Zekna, Abhi, as of now, comments bant rahenge. To bol. Okay, hmm. So, what ends up happening is we have a huge problem in determining the earliest human sacrifices. Mm -hmm. We know for a fact that uh, cannibalism and sadistic torture. Mm -hmm. are very, very early. Chimpanzees do it. Okay, chimpanzees yeah, they are very, do. very sadistic. They, they torture for pleasure. Dude, they, they eat torture fingers. Kids. Fingers eat. Yeah. They eat no, they, 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 they deliberately choose methods of killing that exacerbate the pain. No other animal does that. Lions, tigers, leopards. They will cause pain when they're young, inexperienced hunters. Okay, when they're making their first few kills. Once they become more sophisticated, they dispatch the prey like that. Because it's dangerous for the prey to remain alive. They don't go around toying with their prey. So, we, th there is enough evidence of torture and killing 
So, for example, in Spain, you have a Paleolithic uh, 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 site where 12 members of a family were butchered and killed and eaten from about, what, uh, 30,000, 40,000 years back or so. Mm -hmm. The question is, where does a human sacrifice come about? Now, for this, we have to get conceptually into the human sacrifice. And this is that power of abstraction. Mm -hmm. Ki a guy who has just discovered fire, who has just discovered how to make stone tools, how is he able to think so far? You know, even thinking into the future, is a very sophisticated thought process. A squirrel thinks only of the winter. A bear thinks of hibernation only in winter. And so it eats up. But that's a six-month period. But it is also a sort of sign of future thinking. Where does the future thinking of a barter transaction where I provide my time, my goods, my life or blood to a god in return for benediction in the future, arrive. It's very problematic. We will probably never have the answer to that. So it becomes problematic identifying where the first human sacrifices and if human sacrifices started in one population and spread as homo, uh, uh, homo sapiens spread, was it a cognate feature that existed also in Neanderthals and therefore did it erupt sort of simultaneously in a lot of cultures? Uh, I don't have any answers to that. But these are the important questions when you're dealing with this that you have to understand. And I'm going to start my sh share screen again. I want you to see the spread of human sacrifice in that we know. Uh, because remember, again, this is all archaeology dependent. You can only determine a guy might have been killed in the forest. But unless we have a sort of spiritual setting nearby, we can't exactly determine if it was human sacrifice. Right. So around 2000 years back, we have evidence of human sacrifice in Japan. Around uh, three and a half, four thousand years back, we have evidence of industrial scale human sacrifice in China. Industrial money in the hundreds, probably even ranging up to the thousands. Okay. And these are retainer sacrifices for uh, 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 kings and uh, things like that uh, during the uh, Shang dynasty. Hmm. Uh, we also have examples of human sacrifice happening out here in this area. And about 5,000 years back, we also have evidence of human sacrifice in Malta and in uh, Crete. Crete, kahan pe hai? Crete, Malta, where Malta kahan gaya? Malta yehi kahi hai. Theek hai? So you have examples of that. We also have examples of human sacrifice happening at the Pontic step somewhere here. Okay. Now, what Abhijit, happens is be, before you go, can I uh, can I ask a question here if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah, feel, feel free, feel free to. Uh -huh. So, how does one determine uh, archaeologically whether the human sacrifice has happened? Like, so, so let's say, see, all these are determined how. So, I'm digging, I find graves. Like, how do I know this is a human sacrifice? Like, uh, there has to be a clear severed head or severed hand or severed fingers, or, or it could just be torture, right? It's like, how does one determine that if you don't mind me asking that? Right. So, so that's what I said. So uh, it, it's, you can find a tortured body. It could have been a human sacrifice, but there has to be a spiritual context of the setting. So, for example, if a human was not tortured, say just head was chopped off in a grove, all the trees there have died. It may have been a human sacrifice, but we will never know it was a human sacrifice. All we know is that it's a violent death. Okay. Whereas the areas that I'm showing you, so for example, Jomon, which is Japan, either we have the context of a dedication ceremony of a building where a corpse is found crushed under the pillar. So, and there is a prayer, something, something with it. You know, talismans and tokens. So we know it is an offering. In uh, 
China, these people are buried alive in the tombs of the Shang emperors. Many people buried alive, some of them clubbed, some of them chopped, but they're be uh, uh, mostly buried alive in the tombs of the Shang emperors. Mm -hmm. So we know it is a spiritual context that these people are meant to serve in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in Iraq, it is retainer sacrifice that they are buried with the ruler. So we know there is a religious context. In uh, the Pontic step here, it's either somewhere, I uh, forget to mark the exact site, but it's either in, uh, well, this is also technically Eastern Russia as per uh, Putin uh, right now. <coughs> but... Uh, uh, there is a religious context to it because there are dolls and things like that placed around. Well, I mean, we think deities placed around the uh, uh, this thing. In uh, Egypt, again, it is retainer sacrifice that they are placed in a religious context to serve the pharaoh in his afterlife. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we see is the other places where we get human sacrifices are Germany, Denmark and the UK. Uh, and in this particular area, we have Bronze Age sacrifices, not Sweden at this point, but just this, this triangle. We have evidence of Bronze Age sacrifices. They're called peat bog bodies. Now I can show you a peat bog body. Peat bog mummies, they're called. Uh, let me share my, I am sharing my screen. Good. Uh, see these? Hmm. The positioning is interesting. Yeah. Now, we know this because, you know, in this cord around this person's neck, there are religious talismans, there are markings, there are tattoos on the skin. Uh, there is a very clear slicing. There is no sign of being bound, etc., etc., etc. It was done very... Uh, the artifacts found with it were religious in nature. So it was clearly offered to the gods in return for something. And like I said, these are about four or 5,000 years old, right? Uh, in this uh, triangle, in the Denmark, uh, this one is in Denmark, the one I showed you. Mm. Uh, so we know that this is happening roundabout. At least we're finding archaeological evidence from around 5,000. From 5,000 to 4,000 years, until about 3,500 years back, we find evidence here. We find evidence here. We have literary evidence that it happened here, though we have not found archaeological evidence here. We know it was happening here in this area. We know it is happening here and here. This is 2000. This is not 3000. So let me leave Japan out of it. Okay. So we, therefore, the assumption is that this is something late Paleolithic that picks up significantly in the Bronze Age. In India, remember, you do have mentioned there is literary evidence, there is no actual archaeological evidence of human sacrifice. Because you have the Purusha Medha Yagya. Okay. What is the Purusha Medha Yagya? What is it uh, described as? Uh, well, uh, we don't have a description of what the Purusha Medha Yagya involved. Mm -hmm. The Ashwa Medha Yagya is where uh, you all hear the nice bits about Ashwa Medha Yagya where the horse is uh, sent running around kingdoms and the king is mm -hmm. meant to fight wherever uh, it goes. If the king, if the uh, uh, neighboring king does not submit. But mm -hmm. you know what happens to the horse after that? Well, not good things. Not good things. Mm. Uh, the question is, do we want to talk about what happens to the horse after that? I don't know if that will be allowed on the video. or uh, they'll. I mean, I can always uh, tag it as sensitive material. That's not a big deal. Yeah, just tag it as sensitive material, man. So okay. the horse is first worshipped. Uh, there are meant to be two queens. For some reason, yes. the Ashwamedha Yagya requires two queens always. Yes. Uh, the uh, queens are meant to simulate fornication with the horse. Uh, the horse is fed Kusha grass, you know, love and Kush. Uh, Kush mm -hmm. is named after, or Kusha grass is named after that. It's a very specific kind of grass. Before it is regurgitated, uh, 
when it goes in the first time into the horse's stomach, the horse's stomach is meant to be slit open. Mm-hmm. Uh, the queen is then meant to lay. One, the second queen, the one who did not simulate fornication with the horse, is meant to lay inside the corpse the entire night. And the next day, the horse is then roasted with ghee and eaten. Okay. Now, Purusha uh, we don't have a description of what happened. Uh, it just says, as for Ashwamedha. So, what happened is up to you. There has never been any archaeological evidence found. The thing is, but but then if it is uh, no archaeological evidence found, also shows that it must be very rare. Otherwise, it's very you know IVC level. Pe to mili jana it's only talked about once. It's only mm. talked about once. Yeah. In the Indus Valley civilization, we have absolutely no proof of human sacrifice Nothing. at all. At all. In fact, I would say we don't even have proof of animal sacrifice because there is no uh, uh, of all the bones discovered. Kushal, correct me if I'm wrong. But I've never read about a animal being found, the animal remains being found at a site of presumed religious significance. Is that correct? No, so not at uh, the altars. Nay, they found it in the tandoors. Whenever they found animal the, bones the, yeah, in the IVC. In, but a tandoor is tandoors. not a religious site. Yeah, yeah, in the I mean they would find odd animal bones uh, in the the yagya sites, but very rarely, and they could be contamination. They could not necessarily be that. exactly. We don't. We don't. They, they, unlike say China, uh, 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 the northern uh, uh, European Triangle, Crete, where there is crystal clear proof, there is context in Crete, for example. Uh, an earthquake actually captured the moment of the sacrifice where the person was being slaughtered. An earthquake happened at that exact time and it killed the two attendants, the priestess with the knife in her hand and obviously the guy who had been sacrificed. Uh, the temple collapsed on them and so we literally have a snapshot of a sacrifice at that point of time. Yeah, but don't you think right. it is fascinating for a uh, civilization like India, which has had all kinds of sacrifice uh, ka culture, Homa culture, Yagya culture, human sacrifice is so rare in India. It is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, is it rare or was it sanitized out? Okay. This is a question that keeps getting asked and I come down on the side of it was rare. And I'll tell you why it's rare. Now, see, there are two arguments that uh, are constantly upheld. We know that South Asia, which is, again, I'm not going to call it South Asia. I'm going to call it the Indian subcontinent. Akhand Bharat. Uh, Akhand Bharat. So we know for a fact that in Akhand Bharat, see, it is at the crossroads of three of the early human species. Homo florensis and uh, uh, the Asian man is generally found here. The Denisovans and the Neanderthals are found here. Okay. Uh, a Homo sapien is found here. How is it that in India you only have one primitive skull called Narmada man that is the only prehistoric fragment found in India? How is it humanly possible? You tell me. Okay. So clearly that is not the case, right? I mean, we can say purely on a statistical basis that the thing here is that our archaeology is so bad that we haven't dug it up because being in the crossroads of all three, you know, uh, uh, Neanderthals were found right up to here. Denisovans were, are the Denisovan range includes this area, possibly even up to Kyrgyzstan. How is it that you're not finding anything out here? Clearly, there's something wrong with the image. And that has to do with, uh, you know, the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence like this. And also, okay. if you look at the flow of the original humans, they come all the way down to the Andaman Islands. So, I mean, the, yeah, the, exactly. the spread of land them is so there. huge. Uh, no, no, there was a okay. land bridge there. But the point is the uh, the spread is quite a lot, right? From one side to the other side of the country. Right. Uh, but remember, this area is actually very rich in human remains. And it 
because if you look at it technically, the uh, Andaman Islands are an extension of the Arakan Mountain. So this is the Arakan Mountain. The Arakan Mountain goes underwater here. It's the exact same ridge that becomes the Andaman and Nicobar Islands here. So, you know, there is cultural continuity. You find things here where cultural continuity is here. What I'm talking about is Mukhya Bhumi, as they call it in Andamans. They call it the Mukhya Bhumi proper. There is little to zero evidence here. Okay. This is point number one. Point number two. If we assume, why is it that you have, uh, when you have four different human species bordering us, four, five, possibly even six human species bothered, uh, bordering us, why is this area so anthropologically poor in terms of fossil uh, remains or remains in general? Then the corollary, and this is the second argument, is that if China has so much industrial human sacrifice in China, Agar, if there was industrial sacrifice here, if there was industrial sacrifice, human sacrifice here, if there is industrial level human, well, this was actually industrial, this was solitary, this was reasonably large scale and reasonably large scale. Why should it also not be here? Why is mm. India isolated? I'll tell you why, because the burial culture here is very, very different from all these other areas. For some reason, Body preservation is very important here. It is very important here. But even in the Indus Valley, which is archaeologically very well attested, there is no culture of body preservation. Sanauli, therefore, is the freak show in all of this. But Sanauli okay. is and more Sanauli... gadgetic, less IVC. Na? But Sanauli is somewhere here, no? Haan, magar wo it's late IVC. Or IVC ke border pe hai. No, but that doesn't matter. The point is it's same time frame. See, if 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 this we know was a human hotspot where you can't find remains, logically, why is it that this is a human sacrifice hotspot, this is a human sacrifice hotspot, but this is not? I mean, they and did the have reason burials, is very simple. Abhiji, wait, 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 had... Michelle, don't, don't, don't. They had burials, but they did have burials, but they are few and far between. We are not discovering massive burials and we are certainly not discovering retainer sacrifices. So the burial culture itself was different. See, burial is different from preservation. Here you are preserving something for the afterlife. Here you are preserving something for the afterlife. Here you are not looking. Sanoli is one of the rare instances where you have a significance of grave goods. Tell me in the IVC where you have a bury a rich burial with grave goods. Look, so from whatever archaeology I have read in IVC, the burials are very specific. They have uh, a a particular direction. If I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember the direction. I think it was westwards. They they used to bury in a particular fashion. See, that is not the point. It is the orientation has been happening since uh, Neanderthal times. Neanderthals also had a specific orientation of burial. Mm -hmm. Second, I'm talking uh, specifically about grave goods. Understand the abstraction out here. You are putting something with the body to take into the next life. Yeah. Whereas... That is there in IVC, Abhijit. It is there in IVC. Where? Okay. It is, there in Rakhi Gadi. It, it is there in Rakhi Gadi. It is there in Rakhi Gadi. Okay, uh, wait, I'll show it to you. In fact, uh, pottery bhi milegi tere ko, burial ke saath. Pottery tak milegi. Uh, do log bhi buried milegi tere ko, Abhijit. I can show it to you. Wait, I'll show you. No, no, log buried milegi, Baba, but grave goods. Yeah, I, just for example, this. I've just shown it to you. This. Uh -huh, yes, huh, and this, this is one. where? Okay, this I'll have to check. Rakhi Gadi, see? I told you, Rakhi Gadi mein mila hai. And which what? which year is approximately cup? Uh, wait, I'll have to check the year. I'll have to because I, I I'm opening research gate, huh, by the way. Matlab, onga -onga mm -hmm. hai. This is research gate. Mm -hmm. uh, because I remember mm -hmm. uh, reading about this. Uh, I accept one point that you're saying. Main ek point dunga. It is very rare in, in, in IVC. Both come. 
कम है विद द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ क्या होता था में ज्वेलरी भी मिली है मगर बहुत कम मिली है ज्वेलरी भी मिली है मगर बहुत कम मिली है ज्वेलरी इज फाइन इवन नियंड था बेरियल ज्वेलरी विद इन यू नो समी पुट flowers at a neanderthal burial those flowers have been preserved uh, the impression of the flowers has been preserved in the uh, mud in the clay around it theek mm. hai uh, but this is what you showed me i hadn't seen but uh, generally the culture of grave goods would uh, naturally indicate retain a sacrifice except we don't have nobility burials this is still a very ordinary burial for the amount of wealth that harappa possessed again that is a very good point in fact that is one of right. the things that so, uh, many so that scholars is the second have layer that comes in which yeah. is elite burials so it's grave goods uh, now an ordinary person agar mai marunga and i say that you know oh uh, 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 my dogs should be burnt alive with me on my body i think the half of delhi's rspca uh, uh, spca will come down on me and there'll be a case against me even a post death saying cruel bastard killing your own children like that etc etc if a king says it it happens mm mm-hmm. uh elitism is the second part of this which is why i said sanauli is a it's strange because there's a great wealth of grave goods there which shows a kind of stratification it shows a stratification in an elite segment of society the caliber of grave goods that you're showing me which all seem to be clay they don't indicate great wealth do they they certainly don't indicate social stratification the, see the thing the unique thing about the ivc is that there were very few such no, 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 no. Very... ivc money exactly now you did not even in what and you know when we talk about elite burials we still postulated elite burials where Ex- the caliber of ex- grave goods thoda na thoda current language karke explain kar elite burial matlab aaj ki date mein jaise jay lalita ki humne samadhi banayi what wo jo tu bol raha na exactly correct okay right Uh, nahi so that the viewers and the you... listeners comprehend what you're talking about it's very important to explain mm. to them with that example yeah sorry i keep getting because i assume everybody understands the abstraction uh in a bronze age society remember when we talked about palace economies in the bronze age collapse we talked about how power capture was much 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 greater in the bronze age than it was in the iron age so the elites in the bronze age were much more powerful at that point of time so the resource extraction and concentration that happened at the top was incredible and the clearest example of this is the pyramids why is it that the pyramids are built in the bronze age egypt but iron age egypt builds absolutely no pyramids they build tombs but they don't build pyramids or anything as big as that across the globe even in china why is it that the shang dynasty which is a bronze age dynasty is where you see these massive tombs and burials but it stops after that it's there is such a thing as elite resource capture which is worst in the bronze age where it is only palaces trading with each other for high end goods because well the cost of trade is very very high as opposed to democratized trading that becomes vogue in the iron age so this resource capture this kind of elite uh, iron age mein dekho elite ka difference itna hoga but bronze age mein elites ka difference itna hoga social difference theek hai so this keep this at the back of your mind and the greater the power differential the greater what we would in modern lingo woke lingo called abuse which is you can ask humans to be sacrificed for you theek hai now uh, this is where are you shit i've broken my train of thought now kushal tu ek number ka chutiya hai maine kuch nahi bola hai maine kuch nahi bola mujhe mat blame kar ne where did we leave off before we were... i got to elite certification ah okay let me start sharing again now don't interrupt me for a while till i give you permission to interrupt okay uh, amma okay okay so 
Here, you surprisingly find that it is not a gr rich grave goods culture. Sinauli is the exception. Uh, I don't think we've ever found a tomb like Sinauli. And I was half expecting when I heard about Sinauli to hear about some kind of human sacrifice out there. And it did not happen. So I don't think it is a sanitization. I think the death rituals here had diverged from the rest there is a case of Indian exceptionalism, of Indian spiritual exceptionalism to be made, where Indian spiritual rituals had already diverged from this entire circle that you see here, well before by about 5,000 uh, uh, years ago. Okay. Not completely, but quite significantly. Uh, I do not believe that there was a large-scale human sacrifice. It was extremely rare, and you will find a very... Stunning example when we do this, when we move to the new world, that it can actually happen. You can have a culture that says, no, we're not going to do this or we're going to do this very, very, very rarely. Now, when does this stop? In Egypt, it stops even during the Bronze Age itself. It stops in uh, 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 after the first dynasty, you do not have retainer sacrifices. Uh, in Iraq, again, it stops immediately after the Sumerian period. However, surprise, surprise, in this area, in Lebanon amongst the Phoenicians, it carries on right almost down to Roman times. Okay, they had something called the Tophet, where the firstborn child was sacrificed to the gods. And we're talking late into the Iron Age that this was done. Okay. Uh, you have a picking up different kinds of sacrifice that happen around 2,500 years back in this area. And you begin to start seeing the first examples of human sacrifice, well, archaeologically attested. It could have happened before, I don't know, in uh, uh, Gotland, Gotland uh, uh, this area generally of Sweden. Take it. You also begin to start seeing a lot more evidence for sacrifice in this entire region uh we don't know again because see just the archaeological thing doesn't prove that this is when it started uh, it's just better preservation i mean it's easier to preserve things over 2000 years than i guess 5000 years uh, 2500 to 5000 years kind of thing in india again we only have literary evidence of human sacrifice at this point Okay, and I'm very critically excluding this part. So, Anga Bongo Bideha and this part, which is kind of Khmer Mon, I am excluding from the scene for the time being. Okay, now, around 2500 years back, you see sacrifice all over the place. Uh, and when I say, sorry, before, before I get to that, when I say literary evidence, Greece, Greece, what is the exa example of human sacrifice? Uh, literary evidence, well, it's Ag Agamemnon sacrificing his daughter, uh, Iphigenia, uh, before uh, they set out for the Trojan War. And his wife, uh, of course, uh, kills him at the end of that for killing Iphigenia. Uh, uh, was it Iphigenia? I forget. Anyway, uh, So you see, this is how human sacrifice starts and it ends very abruptly. Here it ends in the Bronze Age. Here it continues deep into the Iron Age. They were doing this even during, uh, you know, when uh, Augustus's troops came and got defeated at the Teutoburg Forest here. It was happening even in the Roman period here. Uh, it was continuing well into about 980 or so in this area. Uh, it stopped about 1,500 years. Well, I mean, we don't have evidence. Uh, 1,500 years back here. Uh, it stops with the Bronze Age, with the Iron Age, uh, more or less. Uh, it's very significant because China is one of the places where the last human sacrifices actually take place. Uh, surprise, surprise. In India, it still continues up to this day uh, in certain areas, almost exclusively associated with the Shakta cults. Now, there is a belief that Shakta cults actually come from the Himalayan uh, Tibetan border. Uh, because remember, we do not worship. Today, we do not worship the Vedic gods. We pay lip service to them. All our mantras are from the Vedas, but we worship Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, uh, 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 Durga, etc., etc., who are not Vedic gods. They are given Vedic attributes. 
but they are not Vedic gods. Uh, so this is the stat or, uh, status of human sacrifice out here. It is very important to remember that nowhere in the old world, okay, nowhere in the old world will you find torture sacrifice where the sacrifice is deliberately tortured for a while before being killed. And this then brings us to the new world. Okay, because this is a very, very important aspect of where we are getting. In the new world, a lot of sacrifice is just plain simple torture sacrifice. They are tortured for prolonged periods of time before being killed. Okay, uh, we have uh, almost six, seven thousand year old examples of human sacrifice in the Americas. Uh, supposedly, uh, you know, there's a huge debate if the Solutrean hypothesis and the Clovis culture. Technically, archaeologists tell us that there were no people here before 13,000. They came from here uh, and they slowly, very rapidly, in fact, not slowly, sorry, spread out all the way right up to here. We have significant examples of early human sacrifice here, here, here at the same time. Now, human sacrifices are happening here and in Peru at the same time that they are happening here, which is to say four and a half thousand, four and a half to five thousand years back, except here and here they are particularly nasty and brutal. Okay, people are being the examples for the moche, uh, the examples of the Olmecs here. They are nasty, nasty, nasty sacrifices. Again, we do not know why. But what we do know is that these people, unlike these people who transitioned to the Bronze Age, these people never transitioned out of the Bronze Age. And the problem becomes that as this area remains trapped in the Stone Age, the brutality of these sacrifices remains constant all the way from here right up to here. There is a lot of torture involved in those sacrifices. Of course, some are just direct sacrifices. Let me give you an example. So, for example, Kahokia, which is about a thousand years old, you have people sacrificed simply by, uh, you know, uh, uh, whipping their legs. Their legs are whipped. And, you know, I, I invite our audience to take a scale and whip the palm of your own uh, uh, foot. It is excruciating. These people were literally whipped till the flesh fell off and the whip hit the bones. And then they were hacked to pieces. Okay. Uh, if a warrior was captured, uh, he had to take the place of a dead son of the tribe. He would be fed and looked after as a son, but after those two, three days, he would literally be tortured to death and he had to endure the torture bravely. Oh, yeah, yeah, pieces yeah. would be hacked off him. They would throw boiling oil or boiling water on him. They would hack off pieces of his genitals and he had to keep dancing through the entire thing and endure this. So the kind of sacrifices you see in the new world, you simply do not not see and systematically, institutionally, across thousands of kilometers of territory, so consistently. Okay, I'm not going to go into the Olmec and the uh, 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 Moche uh, and the Shavinda Huantar sacrifices. They're really, really gory shit. Uh, they were horrible. They were truly horrible. Okay, uh, but. What happens is we see towards the end when the Spanish, just before the Spanish come, uh, about 500 years back, the Incas stop that. We don't know why again. Remember, these were overwhelmingly illiterate societies, except the Mayas who developed a language. These are illiterate societies. Uh, 
for whatever reason, the Incas say that we are going to sacrifice very, very rarely, maybe once in 10, 15 years, maybe even once in 30, 40 years, where somebody will be sent up to the top of a sacred mountain, one person, one or two people will be sent up to the top of a sacred mountain. There will be no torture, torture. You will be given lots of cocoa to put you in an intoxicated state, uh, essentially primitive cocaine, I guess, some kind of primitive opioid uh, uh, to put you into an intoxicated state. And you will be clubbed on the head to fasten the process. You don't know what's happening because you, you are in a complete uh, uh, hallucinogen, hallucinogen induced sleep uh, and in that sleep you are either strangulated or clubbed at the head mm. they do not get rid of human sacrifice but I would say Incas as a culture have the least amount of sacrifice again like in Egypt after the first dynasty retainer sacrifice stops we do not know why the Inca decided enough is enough we're not doing this shit anymore we simply don't know because at the same time, their contemporaries in the north, the Aztecs, are doing like sacrifice to a level that wasn't even seen before. At the consecration of the main temple of Tenochtitlan, uh, over a five-day period, 20,000 people were sacrificed. They had things called Zompantli, which was the skull rack, uh, where the sacrificial victims would have their heads put up on display. Almost like, you know, flowers, in a sense. Uh, and they discovered excruciating these strange ways of torture. So, for example, for the rain god, uh, you had ch chi torture child sacrifices where children would be taken to a water source and they would be tortured throughout the way. Their fingernails would be pulled out and things like that. Uh, and they would be crying. And the, the, the intention, was we know this for a fact because it's uh, 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 listed not in a foreign source, but in a native source, uh, that the children would cry because the crying was desired. Because the more the child cried, the more the rains would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you had the harvest sacrifice, which was, uh, you know, to uh, signify regeneration a man and a woman would be made to copulate. They would be thrown into the fire. They wouldn't be allowed to die. The fire would char their skin like bengan ka bharta. You would then remove the bengan ka bharta from the fire or the insan ka bharta from the fire, remove the skin while they were still alive and then be thrown back into the fire. These were horrific, horrific sacrifices happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this is where you have this whole thing. This is where the hypothesis comes that it starts off in the late Stone Age. Because remember, the New World is a late Stone Age culture. They are Neolithic cultures in, a, in the Gunpowder Age. Decisively in the Gunpowder Age, you have a parallel universe with a late Stone Age, an entire continent that exists in the late Stone Age going on. Which is why we believe rather I believe, in my hypothesis, is that it is a late Stone Age innovation that comes out of uh, 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 a, a sort of uh, ability to abstract a certain elite control of society, so stratification and hierarchy, which dissipates quite considerably. Now, if you remember the uh, 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 Bronze Age podcast that we did, uh, you, you remember how we discussed the sources of tin, which were critical for making copper into bronze and how that was a very expensive material to get because it came from far away, as opposed to iron, which democratized the entire thing and reduced the social uh, hierarchy significantly because iron you could produce anywhere. You just needed more energy and more efficient forms of harnessing that energy heat in order to produce smelt iron. Mm. So what you see is, is it linked? We, we don't know the linkages. We simply don't know the linkages because there is no theology of human sacrifice listed out. It's possibly gotten sanitized or whatever. That it's compressed this time frame down. And we still don't then understand how the Incas who are still very much in the Stone Age said enough is enough. No more of this crap. 
Was it a theological evolution? We do not know. We will never know. Uh, primarily because they were illiterate societies and largely what we know about them, except the Maya, is written by other people. The Maya wrote about themselves uh, because they were the only people to have a hieroglyphic script at that point of time. And of course, the Maya did sacrifices of, uh, uh, again, a lot of torture sacrifices. This is common, like I said, to that entire thing. We don't know why this phenomenon ends. We really have no clue. I suspect it has to do with the reduction of elitism and therefore the power of elites relative to society in the Iron Age and the democratization of society that Iron brings about. Again, you. this is not in a history book. This is my uh, hypothesis. Feel free to abuse me. Uh, however, it is very surprising where human sacrifice continues by old age societies well into the 1600s and 1700s. One is China. Okay, so the last dynasty of China, the Manchu dynasty, was the Qing dynasty. The really? That new... old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th that new, not that old. Uh, that sorry, new. that new. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, almost the same time that the British unleashed coal power for their mines, for their coal mines to extract uh, uh, water through a water pump, through uh, electric, uh, not electric, a... Uh, Coal powered water pump, whatever you call it. Uh, uh, the Chinese were still sacrificing. The la penultimate Ming emperor, if you go to the Temple of Heaven in China, uh, again, let me start sharing my screen. Uh, I want you to see this. This is the Temple of Heaven. I'll put it up when, when it pops up. I can see it. There you okay. go. Uh, Okay, so this is the Temple of Heaven. This is the image of the Temple of Heaven. This courtyard here mm -hmm. was used for the sacrifices. And we know for a fact, because it is in great detail recorded, that the penultimate Ming Emperor sacrificed five people out here to the gods. Okay, the Qing did not carry out human sacrifice. The Qing did not. The penultimate Ming uh, uh, did. Uh, so this becomes, uh, we don't understand why. Just like today, we don't understand why is it that a society as uh, culturally sophisticated as India would be carrying out human sacrifices till very recently. It's put down to being psycho. Because remember, you have the Kapalik movement in Bengal till very recently. But remember, Bengal was a shamanistic backwater till about five to seven hundred years back. Uh, you remember how we discussed that it was the Turkic dynasties and the Mughals who really started felling forests and opened up Bengal in a sense. Mm. Uh, so, and you find a great deal of this shamanism within the Shakta tradition as well, which is why even today, to Kali, you sacrifice animals. Mm. Kali Bari, there is animal sacrifice. Mm. Uh, you go up to the hills, you know, uh, there is that, uh, uh, it's horrible. I mean, you can go see videos of uh, close to a thousand uh, buffaloes being sacrificed uh, in uh, Nepal. They're literally, they're running scared and they're I was, being clubbed over I, the I was just Actually, about to say that it happens at a mass level in Nepal. Industrial scale uh, 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 sacrifice of bovines. Uh, uh, you know, you still have these, uh, uh, even today in Tamil Nadu, you have temples where goats and uh, chickens and things are op offered up as sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, why does this happen? We do not understand. Uh, I mean, Theoretically, we are a modern society, yet you people feel the need to go and sacrifice. And you know what happens is, I never realized this, uh, we have a sacrifice substitute even in uh, some of our rituals in Tamrams. Right? 
uh, it's substituted with a watermelon. Mm -hmm. You take a watermelon and you smash it. You mm -hmm. cut open a little part, you put kumkum into it, you shut it, and then you smash it, chop it, or something like that, which is clearly some kind of a substitute, sacrifice, uh, uh, whatever. Imagine this continues even today and we don't study. Uh, I have not come across a single sociological paper on why this continues amongst us even to this day. Right. Uh, 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 for Jews and Muslims, to this day, halal or kosher is a uh, sacrifice to the gods. And, you know, at least India is a third world country. But what's your excuse in Israel, which is one of the richest countries on earth? Uh, one of the highest per capita income countries on earth, one of the most developed societies on earth, people there still believe in this, that at Passover an animal has to be sacrificed to the gods. Right. So we then, the second part, and I'm going to finish up very quickly, which I wanted to focus on was the economics of it. Uh, remember, Stone Age societies, human life is extremely valuable. Uh, Stone Age societies tend to be small, and I'll come to the new world later, tend to be small. They live on the edge. Minor climate change can wipe out whole communities. So human sacrifice could not have taken place as long as the community was small because the economics of losing a working member of society was too much. It endangered the entire community. On the other hand, allowing an old person to die, uh, I would say very similar to say Salekhna in the Jain practice, uh, would kind of be economically acceptable because the pros that the old man or old woman brings to the community are overshadowed by the amount of resources he extracts from the community. This could have been an origin of human sacrifice, could have, because remember that calculation is an economic calculation. And for that kind of an economic calculation to happen is a very significant jump in abstraction in the human mind. It requires a sophistication of thought in the human mind. Okay. In a Bronze Age society, that, or even late uh, large Stone Age society, like the New World, what would happen is your life would not be precarious because you have built large societies, because you have invented farming. The difference between a small Stone Age society and a large Stone Age society is farming. Uh, what happens is that it's a fantastic way for the elite to maintain control. It's a fantastic way of getting rid of undesirable people. It's a fantastic way of terrorizing the population. Uh, which is essential for elite social control to happen. Okay, uh, so you evolve from an early economic rationale to a late social control rationale, which goes away with the Iron Age, except for symbolic sacrifices. Now, the question is, do you consider sati to be a human sacrifice? If you accept that, you know, uh, the royal tombs of Ur or the first dynasty tombs of Egypt, or the Shang tombs of China are human sacrifices. They are retainer sacrifices so that somebody can serve their Lord in the afterlife. Do you then accept that Sati is a human sacrifice? Uh, because see, there is an, one second, there is an economic rationale to Sati in Bengal. First, remember Bengal was, to use the colloquialism, civilized very late. Very, very late. We've discussed this in the architecture series that, you know, Bengal produces, in spite of its immense wealth, it produced no worthwhile architecture. Uh, there was the economic rationale that in Bengal, you had the Dayabhaga, where the woman would inherit property. And to prevent that from happening, she, the mother would be killed. Or the, rather, the wife would be killed. Whereas in the rest of the uh, country, you had the Mityakshara system where the woman did not inherit property, where she would not be killed. 
except in certain areas where it did happen. Uh, theoretically, it should have been worse in Kerala because Nair women inherited property. They, heck, they ruled the house, but they were killed probably because they ruled the house. So I come back to you, Kushal. Do you consider Sati to be human sacrifice? Uh, honestly, I don't. And I'll explain why. I think it is gender specific, first of all. The history of human sacrifice in other cultures from whatever I have read has been gender neutral, very interestingly. In fact, gender neutral till the extent of being very much to the male side, less to the female side, because Correct. those who, who who were usually sacrificed were men, sometimes to show their bravado, because they were building an army of sorts that the man who goes through all of it and still survives is the true warrior kind of a nonsense where they was there. Or a child sacrifice, but they would never sacrifice the women. I mean, I look at it purely from an evolutionary perspective is women. Uh, and I'm not saying these, these are my views. I'm telling why ancient humans might be doing it before all the women get excited. They must have looked at women as baby making factories. So they're like, Inko marke koi matlab nahi hai. now let me give you the counter to it. The Incas almost exclusively sacrificed women. Well, yeah. Uh, see, it the, the rare the occasion. The, I, I get the it. rainbow dance and the sun dance uh, in Northern America exclusively invel- involved female sacrifices, where a virgin was tied up, and arrows were slowly shot into her. Uh, you did not target the heart; you had to target all the non-essential parts of the body to prolong her death out to one or two hours, uh, where she would be pumped full of arrows and slowly killed off. So, yeah. So, I'll tell you something different Uh, and something controversial. What I think Sati hmm. symbolizes, Sati much more symbolizes, I am not literally reducing it to that, but I think Sati symbolizes a more religious mindset in the sense, you know how these crazy jihadis think we are going to something higher. Sati actually symbolizes that exact notion where people are basically tied into going into something deeper and higher. That's what Sati symbolizes. Now, human sacrifice comes from a very different... You you have to sacrifice that human to attain something for the larger society. In Sati, the woman is voluntarily, supposedly voluntarily in court, sacrificing herself to attain something for herself, not for the society. Human sacrifices are for society. Sati is for herself. Right. Uh, but it's given. So, for example, Aztec torture sacrifices... Uh, only great warriors were uh, sacrificed. So there's this famous case where one neighboring chieftain was captured and he was sentenced to, not sentenced, he was honored to die in gladiatorial combat where he had to face four Aztec soldiers with only a feather to defend himself. He actually managed to defeat the four warriors using a feather. But then he insisted he be torture sacrificed because he said the gods had ordained that he be captured and therefore it was a great thing to be sacrificed to the gods. There isn't a single human sacrifice that has involved the victim going to hell. They all involve going him or her to a higher place. That's half the mojo of a sacrifice that it's a great honor for you. Even when you're being, especially when you're being tortured. And let's be clear, uh, you know, burning a woman alive is very much, even the Chinese didn't burn people alive. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, and in India is one of the few other places where you actually get these torture sacrifices. Sati is a torture sacrifice. You're burned Volunt- alive. Voluntary. Sometimes not voluntary. Sometimes I think not. even Meenakshi Jain in a book makes it quite clear that sometimes it definitely wasn't. Yeah, voluntary. but most so of the totally, time it was voluntary. Total accounted cases Jain. is what? 3,000 cases over 2,000 years. Approximately is what Yeah, Meenakshi and Jain. it's a rare practice just for the record. It's Extremely a rare, rare. Yeah. Extremely rare. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So basically 1.25 sacrifice uh, uh, satis per year is the total, total documented. Mm-hmm. Okay. Total documented is 3,000 over 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. Uh but, you know, the thing is, uh, there's a very fascinating thing that I found in Madras Museum. When you go into Madras Museum, you will see the first thing out there at the foyer is this sacrificial altar from Odisha, apparently, mm-hmm. which is shaped a wooden thing like this and a wooden stake like that. 
the guy was tied to this and he was literally ground his feet were ground while he was alive mm -hmm. before being hacked so india is one of those very rare places where you have torture sacrifice just like the americas and of course in india it continues to a very late period mm -hmm. admittedly in tribal societies admittedly in societies that did not achieve a high level of human development within india because remember india is extremely heterogeneous in terms of you have odisha modern odisha where you had some of the most civilized civilizations of india that literally went and sacked patliputra uh, 20 years after ashoka's death and at the same time in southern odisha you have uh this kind of a human sacrifice device it's from 1700s or 1800s being discovered you had bengal which led the industrial revolution in india where almost simultaneously kapaliks and sati was happening almost simultaneously uh it's because in india several centuries exist side by side in delhi you will have the 21st century you go out to rohtak you'll have the 11th or the 7th century Uh, I don't have an answer to it. I'm just throwing up these questions. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to end there. Let's go to the questions. Okay, I'm going to ask. There are a few questions. Guess uh, insane. Comments to open them only. Ha, no comment opening is not needed. I'm just questions to read. No, you, you, both, this is what happens. Kamina, so for that, okay. So what could possibly have been thinking? The thinking behind the start of human sacrifice and the continual sacrifice given to gods till this date. like i said we don't know i yeah, mean look within knows. yourself when when you go technically even cracking a coconut is a sacrifice no mm hmm mm. uh cracking a coconut is a sacrifice mm -hmm. uh why do you do it do you believe cracking a coconut brings you good fortune yeah it does i know for a fact i always crack coconuts when i go to a temple and it definitely brings me good fortune i can actually statistically correlate it uh to uh large infusions of wealth that i have had every time i've gone to a temple and cracked a coconut <clears throat> some people find that with chickens and goats or sheep with jews uh why i don't know i mean i've never examined within myself for me it's an unthinking process where i just go smash the coconut for these people was it the same unthinking process there's a very interesting hypothesis that uh a lot of native american societies that were observed much later when anthropology became an art the untouched societies within the amazon mm -hmm. where there was endemic violence where 20 25% of the population used to be get killed off very regularly because of low level systematic violence amongst tribes themselves mm -hmm. the mothers simply would not make eye contact with their own babies mm -hmm. and that is because it when you make eye contact with the babies your heart melts ye itna cute hai to protect it this has also been noticed in papua new guinea where you know endemic warfare happens and cannibalism is rampant uh um, you will not make eye contact with your baby because you don't want to get attached to the baby because you, your rate of survival is so low the emotional withdrawal takes a lot of time mm -hmm. uh is is it is is the same emotion lack of emotional attachment we have to a coconut uh the same lack of emotional attachment that somebody would have to a chicken or a goat bhai butchers uske prime example hai butcher uske prime yeah, example hai emotional dis, uh, detachment are ye chhod de army arm forces arm forces mein aap kar kya rahe ho aap ja ke kisi ko to goli hi maar rahe ho na आ, आ, आप जब आर्मी में जाते हो और आप वॉर लड़ते हो तो यू हैव मेट वे मोर आर्मी पीपल देन आई हैव इन माय लाइफ बिकॉज ऑफ योर वर्क एंड लाइफ यू नो दे आर डिसेंसिटाइज्ड इन फैक्ट यू नो अ लॉट ऑफ एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट बिलीव दैट द आर्मी इज द लास्ट एग्जांपल कंटिन्यूइंग मिलिट्रीज आर द लास्ट एग्जांपल्स कंटिन्यूइंग ऑफ ह्यूमन सैक्रिफाइस इन द पास्ट सो से इन the aztecs you would sacrifice a warrior for better rain today you believe that your country has a superior ideology the idea of pakistan or the idea of india or whatever 
a company of say 12 soldiers goes up the hill in Kargil to fight, you know that three or four of them are not coming back. They are willingly going into that situation. Why? So that the rest of us can be safe and when we can be blessed with good fortune. Does that make it a human sacrifice? A lot of anthropologists believe that patriotism in the military is in fact a form of human sacrifice. It's actually quite a convincing logic. Mm. And and just on Sati, right? I mean, people forget the story of Ahilya Bhai. You know, when Khande Rao ki kitni dust bivya thi, or jo wo jari thi Sati commit karne, to Malar Rao ne Ahilya Bhai ko self immolation se roka tha because she was indispensable for uh, other work. So what what I'm trying to say is a uh, uh, so, you know, kya hota hai ki Sati voluntary thi uske baut saare evidence hai humari history mein aur pressurized bhi thi uske bhi baut saare incidence hai magar rare thi wo sabse common uh, truth hai. So, Ailya bhai Holkar it, it, is a it, classic like story. Caste. It's like caste. It's like caste. Caste discrimination was very common. Uh, a caste apologist will always give you and there is abundant evidence that for every time period you show me of excruciating caste uh, 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 discrimination, there was also a case of zero caste discrimination. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, However, yeah. the caste discrimination was the most predominant as opposed to no caste discrimination. Yes. But for every example you of caste discrimination, I can give you an example in the exact same time period of non-caste discrimination, mm -hmm. which does not mean caste discrimination did not happen. So it's the mm -hmm. same thing here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, kisi ne tha, is Kushagra same as Durva Darbha? Yeah, it is the same as Durva Darbha. Usko wo kya ek English mein word hai yaar bolte hai. Abhi wo exact uh, uski pronunciation mere ko aati nahi hai karne ko. Uh, Desmos, Desmos Takya Bipinata. Aise kuch bolte hai usko. Uska ekdam technical word hai ye. Uh, yeah. wo dar, darbha grass basically ka... Uh, Darbha grass is the same as Kusha grass. So, you Kusha grass ko start me bola tha na? Achha, haan, 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 na haan. Wo, wo question pucha tha. Achha, kisi ne ye important question pucha. This is the most important question. Is this a Halloween special? <laughs> yes, it is. It is a Halloween special because 31st ko Halloween hai, to Abhijit Ayer Mitra has decided to, to discuss uh, human sacrifice. Uh, no. Uh, uh, one important question is, uh, you know, Dragon Master asked, what deities in the Hindu pantheon require human sacrifice? Uh, see, there's no text that actually says they require human sacrifice. It's a convention of human sacrifice. Kali being the most common. Okay, Kali. Not even Durga, only Kali. Kali being the most common. Uh... Again, that is convention. The Kapaliks decided that Kali required human sacrifice. Some people decided that Kali required human sacrifice. Uh, if you actually find the theological, is there any theological justification of human sacrifice? Zero. So require many bolunga. Next. Look, a question I have. Was Native America plus Meso America the citadel of human sacrifice as compared to other pagan tribes like Norse, Greeks, IVC, Turkic tribes? Uh, no. Uh, see, again, it's culturally relative. And this is where cultural relativism is applied in a good way as opposed to most cultural relativism, which is bullshit to explain away jihad. Um, Mesoamerica is the only place where the Stone Age evolved well into agriculture and became empire size. Therefore, the scale of those sacrifices was fundamentally much bigger. As opposed to uh, the rest of the world where the Bronze Age sets in, clearly some kind of checks and balances on the king set in. We don't know what. Uh, and then the Iron Age kind of democratizes and gets rid of this extreme power capture. 
but i won't say that it is first of all i disagree with this characterization that it is human sacrifice central uh, it's just a different anthropological reality because remember all societies behave the same under the same stimuli and same circumstances mm-hmm. that's an immutable rule of sociology okay now uh, someone has asked abhijit ji don't you think islam and christianity is beneficial for the world as due to their influence human sacrifices are completely stopped around the world i have an answer but tu pehle answer kar bhai do you know the basis of christianity itself is a human sacrifice <laughs> that's what i was going to say that is a, that has to be jesus the silliest question is ever god is <laughs> jesus is god torture sacrificing his son for your sins yeah i mean what the hell in fact in fact, uh, in fact the uh, uh, one of the earliest books written which uh, i've got a copy of somewhere is bernardo de sahagun's conquest of mexico uh you know when the christians bring the cross and narrate the story of how christ died for you the maya are so thrilled that they start crucifying their children as sacrifice it's like oh there's a new form of sacrifice that we've got from the west western technology transfer saalon ko thode se keel laga ke board pe khada kar de and the spanish are stunned they're like bhai chod we told you this not for you it, it was meant to be the supreme sacrifice and whatever whatever so understand the kind of torture sacrifices that happened in the new world were a theological shock to the spanish because for them crucifixion was the ultimate torture sacrifice that ended everything where god mm-hmm. sacrificed and here they're like bhai there are a lot more painful sacrifices out here we can't really compete with this secondly in in islam always remember uh, now let oh. us have the discussion uh-huh. we had discussion about islam. sati right what is the suicide bomber what yeah. is it what is it exactly right and it is glorified remember all the aztec moche olmec toltec maya sacrifices they were glorified these were heroes when the enemy king was walking up to be sacrificed without being bound or tied they went like ah 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 haram zada marne ke liye ja raha hai they like wo hai mard dekho wo mard hai asli mard wo hai hmm even today what do they say about suicide bombers asli mar diye hai ye shaheed hai okay yeah i was just going to say that the same analogy applies it is to the people. exact so the basis of christianity is a human sacrifice yeah or or in, the, uh, or, or in japanese the kamikazes yeah uh, e- even that in a sense right uh two important questions here i'll deal with very quickly because i've got to run now uh mahindra was there a heavy use of psychedelics connected to human sacrifices yes there was uh in fact psychedelics uh you know uh, graham hancock makes this case that psychedelics and uh, joe rogan made a very stupid statement that psychedelics led to a more peaceful society wrong they led to a much much more violent society uh There Rogan's a hippie, called, right? Hey, you have to realize he's a hippie. Yeah. Uh, 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 th- there was heavy, heavy use of narcotics, especially mushroom-derived narcotics, which Joe Rogan loves, in the worst of these sacrifices. Uh, except the warrior sacrifices, where the warrior was not meant to. He was he was meant to endure. Hey, his ye ye question acha. Will we see revival of sacrifice of the the, the sacrifice culture when we once we start building human like robots? That's a very good question. That I don't know. I I I I will put my neck on the line. I think we'll start doing it again. We're just jackasses I... of the highest order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, second important question: Incas went folk. Yeah, they probably went folk. They went into yeah. gender ideology and all that shit and went folk, man. Uh, uh, and did Shiva sacrifice him to stop Kali's rage? Uh, see, that's different. Mythology of sacrifices like that is a totally different uh, uh, thing because that is a kind of a spiritual representation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will, of course, Kapaliks interpreted a lot of this as requiring real world sacrifices. So sure. but i i don't think it was 
just ju- i'll just leave uh, you guys with one last thought see the reason human being started RSD, doing RSD, uh, uh, i know i know you have to go to advaita i know so we'll wrap it up now see try one last comment on this is from my end is going to be and then i'll give it back to abhijit is the reason symbols came up is because eventually human beings realize okay this is a bad idea we need we need to please the god some other way so they started doing this nariel or uh, pomegranate or or other animals they stopped human sacrifices and that's how this is the journey of human sacrifice in my view but i'll give you the last word abhijit and then you go and the main reason i did this why i do a lot of this is a lot of you come from this area of being apologetic that somehow we culturally crude that the sati happened and things like that bencho the industrial sacrifice to humne band kar diya na but uh, there's a whole current religion that claims to be ultra modern that's based on a uh, torture sacrifice there's one that celebrates sacrifice uh, uh, what is essentially the same logic as sacrifice as a uh, a uh, uh, shah- shahadat what are you people on about you need to understand the sociology and anthropology and stop being apologetic about things understand it i mean there's no need to uh, 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 do any of this shit anymore it's crude it's unnecessary uh, but don't don't get defensive about it all right if tomorrow you discover that uh, 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 harappa was in fact the human sacrifice central there is a very good anthropological sociological explanation for it it doesn't make you inferior theologically mentally culturally civilizationally in any way okay calm down control your emotions and think about things clearly that's it fair enough i think this was a very interesting discussion uh, let's see how youtube reacts to this and what happens <laughs> i don't know what's going to happen but i know abhijit has to go uh, and uh, speak with advaita to tu ja and uh, next month hum kuch naya topic sochenge and we'll come up with um, something interesting once again i apologize for the microphone glitch in the beginning uh, and abhijit tata bye bye tata bye bye Okay guys Abhijit has to go now so I will remove him from the screen Tuja Abhijit and uh, before we uh, wrap things up once again uh, the aim of today's podcast was not only uh, not, uh, we did not even think of halloween when we decided to do this full disclosure i was just joking but the aim of today's podcast see what abhijit and i try to do when we think of these uh, these topics is we make you think we want you to think and go in different areas and have a different uh, uh perspective on multiple issues so i hope you you understand and appreciate the effort here it is not to make you go on this direction or that direction it's just to make you think in a heterodox way where your cherished beliefs are challenged or your inner views are challenged that that's the sole aim of the charvak podcast and i hope i'm able to do that and i hope you realize that the all of you when you support me whether on youtube or patreon or through upi or through any way by liking the video or subscribing to the, you are basically supporting enhancement of heterodoxy and while we don't remove the orthodox views we are just heterodox because we like to have an open mind So I appreciate all of you standing with me every single day. I will see you again on Monday with an interesting discussion again. It's going to be on a book. And until then take care. Bye bye. See ya.